if the, the sticks you mentioned, 44% of those multiple chronic conditions are in the veteran community. And uh, from the Journal of American Medicine, that it, more or less, if you look at the last three years, and the numbers can be slightly debated, let's say it's five years. Mm -hmm. But in the last five years, more veterans have died from their chronic conditions than all of the battlefields in the history of the United States of America. Wow. Uh, that is is terrifying. So, unfortunately, I think as, as frogs in a pot, right, is whether we're, you know, they're your neighbors, your family members, we almost accept the fact that everyone's got some semblance of chronic condition. The program we're, we're putting forward for 12 months for veterans called the Veteran Health Pack is, is focused on 18 different chronic conditions, which mm. is the vast majority. Right, and it's it's the, the concept of you gotta start somewhere. Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. Welcome to Coffee with Closers, a podcast produced by Pinkston, a strategic communications firm headquartered just outside Washington, DC. We talk with some of America's most influential closers, from industry-leading CEOs to best-selling authors, professional athletes, entrepreneurs, and everyone in between. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, as we take you on an informative, thought-provoking, and highly entertaining journey into the lives of highly successful, driven, forward-thinking disruptors who are making a lasting impact in their field and on society. Joining us on this week's episode of Coffee with Closers is Vince Prophet, the founder and president of Spartan Medical, a veteran owned and operated medical solutions company, which has been recognized as one of the fastest growing private companies, both nationally and in greater Washington. A former Air Force intelligence officer, Mr. Prophet discusses a critical mission he is on today, working to combat the chronic disease epidemic in America, which is a particularly acute problem impacting our nation's veterans. He also discusses how Spartan Medical is working to address our mental health crisis on college and university campuses across the country. We also discuss some of the greatest challenges facing the U.S. healthcare system today, as well as lessons learned in leadership from his time in the military that he is putting into practice to help hospitals, other provider organizations, and clinicians improve health outcomes for more people. Vince Prophet. Welcome to Coffee with Closers. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you for allowing me to be here. All right. Well, uh, we've got a lot to get to today, so let's jump in. Um, I want to start with your company. Um, you're the founder and president of Spartan Medical, uh, Rockville, Maryland-based, uh, veteran-owned and operated medical solutions company. Turns 15 this year, so that's uh, it's a long haul. Love it. Just at a very high level, let's start. Just tell us about what the company does the products and services that you provide, and to whom? Yeah, we started back in 2008, basic med tech focused on implantables, orthopedics, spine, biologics, grafts, things like that. And that's still a major part of our core business. But as technology evolves, uh, that, was, that was really our key to think of. You know, big companies will make great things, and you've got a great sales force and technical support and whatnot, but you're still tied to what that company makes. So, so my concept in 2008 was to say, what, what, how can we provide a, an advanced technology armamentarium where we're not tied to kind of what we have, but what, what the customer needs? So clearly we're in the mid-Atlantic here. And in the you know, following couple years, we, we really got some focus on the federal government because we realized that's our, those are our comrades in arms. Most of us are veterans and whatnot. So we... We figured out a way to, to do all the above and, and always that focus on what is the best, let's go get it. And if we don't have it, let's vet it, source it, and and get a fair, fixed, firm pricing to our customers. So our customers are anywhere from the surgeons to the hospital systems to ambulatory surgery centers, VA medical centers, DOD facilities. And, of course, in Washington, D.C., we're in kind of the epicenter of with Walter Reed and, and prior Bethesda Naval really the epicenter of military training in, in orthopedics and neurosurgery spine. Wow, that's great. Let's take a quick step back. You graduated from the uh, U.S. Air Force Academy, United States Air Force Academy, served as an Air Force intelligence officer, and then you transitioned as a civilian to, to health care, and, and I think you started out with uh, in the medical device space. So just real you know, talk to us a little bit about, you know, how did your military background, your, your experience 
uh, prepare you for the place you have found yourself at today? It was interesting. Tactically, it was uh, being an intel officer, knowing all the threat systems uh, that you were focused on, preparing your air crews, whatever it might be. It was very similar to coming into an industry that I had no experience in, and there are so many different systems and so many different ways to skin a cat yeah. that I learned these systems very quickly just as I would threat systems, targeting systems, things like that in the military. So it, it, it allowed me to get spun up very quickly and add value wherever I was, just as a quick learner, good at math, science, those types of things. Sure. Uh, and paying attention. I, you know, my thing was always, I, I didn't study all that hard after the fact, but my goodness, I paid attention, whether it was academically or any environment I was in. It's It all gets into my head because I'm hyper-focused on, on the presenter. Yeah. So uh, didn't have to review too many notes. and That, that helped me with the, being a good intelligence officer, but in the medical world, it's very similar. Your, your, your air crew, if you will, are now the medical staff and surgeons yeah. using complex devices. So that, that propelled me to, to do very well on that front line of, of medical device sales and support. You said that you started Spartan Medical to, and I'm going to quote you here, I believe, to radically change the way the medical device business works. How so? Well, the concept here is we, we've recently kind of penned this as, you know, everyone else that is in a conference hall or whatever is, is kind of telling you what they have. And, and our concept is, what do you need? Yeah. Let's start there. And that, that's fundamental in, in everything we do. And it's such a, it's kind of a, people look at you a little weird. Like, what do you mean? No one ever asked me that. Yeah. Because the industry is, it may, takes years to develop some of these things. Sure. But most things are developed. And, and our concept is, let's find, let's ask the questions of what you really genuinely need and then what we find is most people may not be asking the right questions. And I don't mean at the surgeon level, but they know what they know. They, they're very good at what – everyone is very good at what they do. Yeah. But the true consultative nature is, is genuinely listening and, and finding. Well, if we don't have it, let's figure out a way to get it and let's educate people. Let's educate hospital systems, administrators, the, the – quality, the, the, the overall philosophy of life is you get what you pay for. But healthcare costs are rising right? and and people want to save money. Yeah. So there's ways to do that, but you got to engage in, in a true consult because there's a balancing act with quality, with competition, with latest, greatest advanced technologies. How does that affect patient care, infection rates? There's all types of things, more efficiencies. Most people want those things but they want them in bits and pieces. So mm -hmm. all those things I mentioned do not get better if you just lower prices. Mm -hmm. You'd say, we want the lowest bidder. And in the military, they always joke about this plane or tank was built by the lowest bidder. Not necessarily true, but yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> that's well, not the plane you want to be in. And I've heard, I've heard in the healthcare world that people are trying to lower overhead, and they may do that, but it doesn't lower the cost of care. Well, especially with the Affordable Care Act, it's the, the re real thing that everyone knows, but I don't know if they're paying close enough attention is if you don't do it right the first time, it's on you, yeah. hospital system. Yeah. And that's the cost. If your low is bitter and you have to keep bringing patients back, uh, that's where the, the profit margins just shrink completely. And then people raise their arms and say, my God, we're losing money. And yeah. then a pandemic comes along and struggling to – Figure out what to do, even though the hospitals are filled with with people. Uh, the the classic way of of being profitable in a hospital is surgeries, relative value units, diagnostic codes, grouping surgeries. That's how they they bill and make money. Yeah, COVID wasn't that way, but the government adjusted and and was was helping anyone that was involved with with trillions of dollars. It seems in in retrospect. So so there's there's adjustment patterns, but but it really comes down to the, the organizations focused on doing it right the first time, the highest quality, yeah. the Affordable Care Act, and a lot of what the, the rules and regulations do is trying to force that, do it right the first time, and that, then you won't, you know, I would say it's hours you spend trying to, to fix something that, that was broken. Yeah. If you do it right the first time, it's 10 times less time spent, you yeah. know, right the first time. So in healthcare, it turns into costs. Let's zoom out a bit now. Um, as we were preparing for today's discussion, um, you described to me a healthcare system today that is 
heavy on bureaucracy, siloed, uncoordinated, inefficient. I think those are all fair to say that adjectives to use here. So how did how did healthcare delivery get so far off course? And what do we what do we need to do to right the ship? Like what 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 is going on today in U.S. healthcare delivery? That's that's because it's not cheap. It's not. It's not. <laughs> and and the thing is, is it's not cheap, but it's it's a question of really, like I said, getting all the all the players. And I think there's many many centers of excellence that that get the doctors from different specialties together to treat a patient. Yeah. Because what you might do from a cardiac standpoint is a balancing act that may affect other things. Or an orthopedic surgeon or neurosurgeon may need to do something. So they get together and they figure out that that scale of balance of one is always going to affect the other. It, and let's go to administrate. If all you want is the lowest cost, quality is going to suffer. Yeah. Now, there's a law of diminishing returns either way, right? So you can be smart about volume, about standardization, but you also don't want to ruin innovation. So one of the things that I, I struggle with is, and I was thinking like with any business uh, leaders that you would have here, I, I would, if it was perfect world, and I'm going to obviously get to get it out, but do you believe that competition is a good or bad thing in America? And I think 100% of people would say, yes, competition is good. Yeah. But when it comes to many of these places to reduce costs, they eliminate competition. And I scratch my head and say, that is the absolute opposite of co competing. That's the concept. If companies are competing, they want to make money. And to do that, they have to have sell, up, sell their products that support them, and they have to beat their competitor. This all sounds silly, right? But you will find in the, in the healthcare system, the lack of competition is somehow tied to reducing costs. And uh, it's, it's really endemic across the healthcare world. Mm -hmm. And and I scratch my head and I, I've had some hospital systems that say, okay, let's say whatever your lowest cost is, let's say I beat it, then what? Well, not interested, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's it, and those are those silos that I'm talking about. What do you mean you're not interested? It's not worth a conversation. Like if you're trying to lower cost, you don't even know what I have yet. But maybe if everything I have is made in America, do you know what you're, what you have right now? Do you know where it's made? Yeah. Did you ask that question? Right. So, so these are things where, if, if I could fix things, it would be just like my idea of getting doctors together from different specialties to treat the whole patient. Yeah. Is the healthcare business side and the quality side and the patient side, they do have to come together in the same kind of triage that you would at the micro level of a patient. And, and, and talk honestly about these things. And if one question is, why are we eliminating competition? Who's, whose idea was this? Well, it was some consulting group that comes around and says, well, we can get X, Y, and Z, we can lower costs, we get rebates. Okay, then what? So that's, that's what you'll see when, in my problem-solving world, it's it, then what happens. Yeah. Right? So, so let's say you do that. Now, how does, let's say, what we have, we're focused on sterile prepackaged, eliminate cross-contamination in, in many countries and all through Europe, UK, prepackaged sterile is the standard. You're uh, not allowed to bring anything in that's not. Yeah. In America, it's not. Yeah. And there's a fight against it. And I'm thinking as a patient, as in, am I, am I, if I have a choice between something that's never been used in a human being and something that was used four hours ago, which one do I want? Right? And then it's like, well, what about the cost? What about the cost? Let's do a comparison. What about the environmental impact? Let's talk about it. Let's put it all together for you with the right questions. We'll get you the right answers. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's great. And, you know, you talked about competition. I'd love to get your thoughts on this. You know, you're seeing Amazon, Walmart, uh, all these retail players are coming into healthcare and they're changing the game and they're not waiting for this system that's struggling to fix itself. Um, they're making healthcare, you know, according to them, affordable, more efficient. Um, so it's really interesting what's going on. There's a lot of, there's a lot of competition going on, and uh, it's pretty, pretty interesting. I, I watched your podcast with the, um, the CEO of Inova, and I, I, I really liked his, his answer on that, and I agree completely, is you don't know what you don't know. And the, the healthcare landscape, although we can, we can improve it and make it better, 
coming in with the same mindsets of the Walmarts and the Amazons. They are very good at what they do. Navigating the healthcare landscape, so I'll refer to your, your prior yeah. <laughs> podcast. Yeah, no, and I talked to him, asked him about it. He was absolutely right. It's like you you don't know what it's like to navigate insurance yeah. claims and, and all these things that the inefficiencies of the system sometimes are built in on purpose, yeah. you know, when it comes to the business side, not from the supply side, but, you know, insurance companies need to do a check. And sometimes they take things too far where they're not getting the patient maybe what they need or they're overstepping the clinical decisions of the surgeon or the or the clinician. But for an Amazon or, or some group to kind of navigate that all, they're very good at what they do. And I, I shudder to think, I mean, Amazon could, you know, take over the, the car industry if they wanted to. But the medical industry, there's, there's a lot of moving parts. And remember, at the end of the day, there's a human being. Mm-hmm. And how you create efficiencies while still realizing that efficiencies are are important in some places, but it has to be balanced. So if you want things ready right now, they have to be sterile prepackaged. You eliminate bottlenecks, right? But then the other side says, yeah, but we don't want to pay for it, right? So there's, there's ways that we can improve care, increase efficiencies. But when you come to the, I've got a hammer and all I see is nails, I think that is going to be very complex to navigate our yeah. healthcare system for these these great companies. Interesting take. All right, let's pivot to some of your initiatives. And I want to start with a big one. Um, I think I read somewhere here, 71% of healthcare spending in the United States is for patients with uh, multiple chronic conditions. Veterans who have uh, MCC account for approximately two-thirds of veterans' uh, affairs healthcare expenditures. Um, you know, we've got a chronic condition crisis going on in our country. You, you look anywhere. Um, I, I'm just looking at it right here. Uh, half of the U.S. population, 133 mil- million Americans living with at least one chronic condition, heart disease and diabetes, two leading causes of death, you know, you name it. Um, you've called it the hidden pandemic. Um, and it's being acutely felt among our nation's veterans. So, and you're on a mission to change that. How so? Well, it really is a mission, and and it's be, it's becoming more of almost like a military mission. Like we are not stopping till till this is heard, and that's why would you invited me here? It was it was I was thrilled for multiple reasons, but the statistics, like you mentioned, are insanely bad. Yeah. So if the, the statistics you mentioned, forty four percent of those multiple chronic conditions are in the veteran community. And uh, from the Journal of American Medicine, that it, more or less, if you look at the last three years, and these numbers can be slightly debated, let's say it's five years. Mm-hmm. But in the last five years, more veterans have died from their chronic conditions than all of the battlefields in the history of the United States of America. Wow. Uh, that is is terrifying. So unfortunately, I think as, as frogs in a pot, right, is whether we're you know, they're your neighbors, your family members. We almost accept the fact that everyone's got some semblance of chronic condition. The program we're, we're putting forward for 12 months for veterans called the Veteran Health Pack is is focused on 18 different chronic conditions, which mm-hmm. is the vast majority, right? And it's, it's the, the concept of you got to start somewhere. And what we do when we customize these solutions, like I said, we don't work for anybody, but we ask the right questions. And if if, if these numbers are so dire then what? What are you doing about it? And and a term I like to use when I'm talking to anyone is, is no matter what you're doing, yet the problem persists. 14% veteran suicides, you know, it's, 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 it's absolutely outrageous. And yet the problem persists. So I think oftentimes, and not just with the government, but I think we oftentimes try to throw money at problems and that doesn't work. I mean, we've been throwing money at some of the biggest problems in the, in the, in the, country or the world for, for many, many years. And that can make a difference. But the idea here is what is the problem? Chronic conditions, if they're the number one killer, what are you doing about it? And there may be an order that says, well, we're trying to educate our patients and whatnot. Okay, then what? So let's put something together where you can get the education. Oh, and if this population is the highest suicide rate in the country, let's make sure they have a 24 seven crisis hotline. Yeah. So that doesn't mean we're replacing anything, but what does it hurt? You know, if you go to get your car fixed and they they happen to wash it and do a, you know change the thread, you know they do all kinds of things that they want to do. You're not going to complain about it, yeah. right? You went 
the same price. So remote patient monitoring, if you're changing people's eating habits that's nutritionally tailored to their chronic conditions, that's one step. That won't solve the problem. So you have to teach a man or a woman how to fish, which is the kind of program that we created. So you've got four remote patient monitoring, not to go to a hospital or anything, but for the, the patient. And they can get 60 minutes with nutritional therapy, group-focused, 8 to 12 veterans with the same chronic condition, getting educated. And they, they, this is all app-based. They get 30% for their dollar on the same type of food through an exchange that they would get that's focused on their condition. So if you're a diabetic or you have heart disease, the, the food will be focused on that. Right. And we go further. If you're a lower-earning veteran, the VA has terrific advice on how to get enrolled in SNAP if, you, if you're eligible. The, this program will do it with you. They'll yeah. walk you through it, walk you in the door type of thing. These are things that are, are absolutely necessary. But if, you, if people aren't getting better, well, how do you know? You've got to monitor them. Yeah. So remote patient monitoring specific to their chronic condition. So if you're diabetic, you probably need a glucose monitor. Now, what if your numbers get out of whack? Then what happens? Yeah. Well, in our program, you get a phone call, a text, and an email. Your numbers are way out of whack. You may or may not be paying attention, but you're going to get a call. It says maybe you ought to get to a hospital or a primary care physician. So it's one of those things where we put together a program where we kept asking what if. And we put all the pieces together. And the group that we work with that provides the, the nutrition as, as you know, food as medicine has done over 40 million delivered meals. You know, this isn't like a thing we just make it up as we go along. Yeah. But we put all the pieces together and, and you have to scratch your head and say, let's be honest about the problem and then have a discussion about real solutions. But don't just pick an A or a D or a Z variable. Let's go start to finish. And if we're missing something, let's do that too. You're listening to Coffee with Closers, a podcast produced by Pinkston, a strategic communications firm based just outside Washington, D.C. Whether your organization is looking for traditional public relations, creative content, or business strategy to support brand awareness or protect against reputational risks, our team of highly dedicated, experienced, and successful communications professionals Stand at the ready to help you break through the noise in today's ever-changing and competitive news cycle. For more on our services and capabilities, we invite you to visit us at pinkston.co. And don't forget, subscribe to our podcast, which is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Amazon, and iHeartRadio Podcasts. And you, this is a, um, this is your own custom solution. You know, we, we put together the pieces and our partner Tangelo has been doing very similar things in the civilian world, but using that, that veteran, veterans, you know, helping veterans type of mentality helps us move things in the right direction, right? So, but the, the amount of people that do the logistics, the, you know, I mean, this, this type of program probably the employment, anytime you put a new program in place, yeah. you're fixing a problem and you're employing more people to, to act on these things. 13.8 million veterans yeah. with, with the largest, most astronomical death rate, out, even outside of suicide. It's like, guys, we got to try something. Yeah. So tell me, no, it costs too much money. No one thinks it does. So, so what is the holdup? And it, it becomes in a large bureaucracy, yet you have to keep finding the right people because of those silos and in the largest healthcare system in the country, the, the veterans healthcare administration, there's a lot of silos. Everyone's trying to do their best, but no one's holding a, a blank check. Right. Yeah. So, so we navigate it, um, you know, through countless man and woman hours at our, at our team and consultants and whatnot to make sure that we can, we can find the right place and we're going to get it. It's, it's just that everyone wants to meet the clinical need, but, Doing something completely different, even though your directives or strategic initiatives of the healthcare system want to do it, no one's put a program together. Yeah. Well, I think other the other, than us. and the other thing I think you a lot of people lose sight of is there's the whole social determinants of health kind of thing too, right? I mean, understanding the patient across the continuum of care, you know, understanding, you know, okay, why do you have chronic conditions? Maybe I live in a community where there's maybe maybe there isn't a lot of nutritious food around or but there's a lot of that too. So, you know, getting to the bottom of what what causes this behavior. 
Yeah. Right. But even further, back to the tactical level, if you're in a rural area and we say all these things are app-based, the next question would be, well, what if you don't have great internet or Wi-Fi yeah, or a smartphone? It, it, Guess what? We'll, there's a program for that as well. Yeah, All yeah. included in, in the program. It's a, you know, we don't want to give everyone a, a smartphone and, and free Wi-Fi, right? But, but it's built into the program where if that's what's going to hold back this veteran or this patient from getting what they need, then we'll, we'll do it. It's included. Yeah. So that's what I mean by what is the problem and keep them coming and yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll fix it. And that's what we do well. But this problem, particularly the, the two that we're focused on is mental health in college campuses, which is the, the statistics are becoming um, untenable. Yeah. And we're talking about 100 to 135 percent from Boston University publications and studies saying increase in severe anxiety and depression. Yeah. And the NCAA is now getting intimately involved starting this year with directives uh, first time they mention in their constitution, the NCAA constitution about mental health. It's like the first time those words have been put together and COVID exacerbated these things. But anyone with a, with a, a kid in college or a brother or sister, uh, I mean, it is, it, it's getting worse and worse. So these are things where we look at the problem and we say this, these, these numbers are just like, why is it this urgent? But the NCAA has made it urgent. Yeah. And the, the numbers in the, in the veteran world are, are beyond urgent, right? So, so we're never trying to be all things to all people, but it's, it's some of these problems are just not that complex if people engage yeah. and have a conversation. So the NCAA, through, the, through what they're doing, through their own internal processes, coaches are reporting. They are they're mentally exhausted. And as coaches do spend a lot of time with their, their student athletes. Yeah. And they become their mentors and they, they become their psychiatrist in chief almost, right? And they're struggling to the point where they need help with mental health and, and behavioral health and, and mental resilience because everyone's worn out. Yeah. Right? So all these things are, are impacting. But when, when severe anxiety and depression are at record highs and increasing in triple digit percentages, that's where it's like everyone stop. Let's take a time out. And even with the NCAA directives coming out, at the beginning of the year, I, I doubt there's 100% compliance. Yeah. So, so let's find something that's quick, affordable, actionable, and we put it together. So if, if anyone listening, like, I don't believe you. Well, call us. As I said, my little yeah. joke is cue the music, call me maybe. You know? <laughs> so, what is the, so, what is, so what are you guys doing in the mental health crisis space? I know, you, I know you're addressing it for college campuses, veteran communities. What, is, there a, is there a health pack sort of? equivalent there is there is and, okay. and more or less it's you know I, I, I don't think we did a major press release but our website has all the all the fundamentals but it's really based on on providing a low-cost application that starts with you know nine question baselines and works with the student you know with you'll call it self-help modules and whatnot but it's tied to unlimited teletherapy yeah um, you know it takes a few weeks to set that up with over 20,000 licensed therapists ready to go but obviously, we got to focus them in on on the numbers and the need, right? But yeah. it's it's almost it starts self guided and then moves to uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Oh wow, that's an adjunct. But it's 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 you know there's there's all types of things you can do group group classes. The, the, the student can go where they 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 need to most go in a comfortable, safe place. But the amount of kind of putting all the different apps, if you will, out there, getting them together and putting in the right place. But the unlimited teletherapy is really critically important. And that was a piece where, as we're putting it together with our partners, it's like this, they, they, it can't be, you know, once a month, yeah. right? Or maybe it can be if cost is the issue and that's what you want for your students, then we can go down to the most inexpensive thing ever existed. Cause again, you get what you pay for. Yeah. Like the people doing the work have to get paid as well. Right. Yeah. The teletherapists and, and, and licensed therapists. So, so it's, it's like, there's, there's not one size fits all for anything, but if we could do more than anyone else at less of a cost and it's ready to go now, try something. Yeah. If it's not us, that's fine. Yeah. But the, the apathy, if you will, the, well, I don't know what to do. The, the people in a small college campus or university weren't born knowing how to deal with a pandemic, yeah. uh, mental health crisis on their campus, but ignoring it doesn't help. Yeah. Wow. So put something in place 
us or somebody else, but but you can't just shrug your shoulders and say, I don't know what to do, or we don't know where the money is. It's There's plenty of money to deal with these things. What costs a lot more, like I said earlier, is dealing with a crisis without anything in place. Yeah. And, and the cost, whether it's a uh, a terrible incident, at a, at a, I don't even want to talk about those things, but just the, the ability. What happens when you do nothing costs lives it costs treasure it costs it, it costs emotional turmoil that never ends yeah try something yeah well that's good you guys got a lot going on um the medical device industry is very competitive um and i'm looking at some of your uh company accolades you're one of the fastest growing private companies both in greater washington and nationally um from a services standpoint what makes spartan medical uniquely different than other competitors in the space yeah, I think it comes back to what do you need? Yeah. And when people engage, our our loyalty rate for our customers is 100%, yeah. right? So we don't lose customers because we don't have something or, or we don't know what we're doing. It's just, it's just a question of, you know, it, I think a lot of medical device companies, you're trying to get more widgets moved because they're better, stronger, faster, right? So that may get you the door at certain places. It may increase your, increase your revenue volume. We don't really do any of that, right? Yeah. It's it's how do we add value in a way that people come to us once they know what we can do, they they'll keep coming to us. Yeah. So that engagement level, I think that's a testament to our growth because it's not cyclical in a sense of we got a brand new widget, right? So so you'll see that oftentimes in companies when they acquire another company or something, revenues go through the roof, but it's you're not keeping long-term customers necessarily which is which is our goal yeah. through really how we how we our culture our people i mean everyone has um the, the care factor that is just why we're the best place to work right it's yeah. it's you know this place where we are right now amazing place to work <laughs> Thank now, you. don't good. tell the rest of my spartan team that i'm applying <laughs> for a job here because this place is amazing yeah. but but the, the concept here is like that those awards are based on what those people say there yeah. is no interaction between you know executive management so those type of things are are most important because it's 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 the mission orientation it's the yeah. we're doing something different we're making a difference in the world and and my team is 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 the best at it speaking of mission um i understand you know mission mission focused leadership servant leadership by another term it's very important to you in the way you operate and your teams what does that look like? Well, for me, it's honestly the only way I know how to do business. But yeah. what I find is with the rest of my executives at every level of the organization, no matter what, I mean, you, you got to have some level of organization, but we're not the military, right? Yeah. So we're very still small family team focused, but it's the same thing. I mean, I was a cadet. The hardest type of leadership is peer leadership, right? It's yeah. very similar. We, we are all peers trying to focus on a mission. Yeah. So it's not as... You know, uh, like I'm sure the large companies, the fires of the world, I mean, they've got so many levels of, of management and whatnot. That's what you need to employ hundreds of thousands of people. So that mission focus orientation, I, I think of it like, I say, I would have been a better, you know, I'm a better captain than I would have been in general, right? Because mm -hmm. I can I can run this team. And that's probably why, you know, if someone said, would you like to run this 100,000 person company? I'd say, mm, you couldn't pay me enough. It's just, it's, it's different. It's not yeah. where my impact can be because of that ability to affect the mission at the front lines. And that's kind of everything we, we, we attempt to do. And it's, a, it's, you know, infectious across our organization. So that's, yeah. that's the mission focused leadership. And you have to be cautious with that because if your mission is, is BS, uh, you can preach it all you want. Yeah. Right. So it has it has to be real. It has to be truthful. We have to sit back and debrief. We have to know how we can get better. But we have to also know what are we doing here? Is it important? Yeah. And if it's just marketing spin, you can't have mission oriented leadership and you can't get the buy in and the focus and the long hours and the commitment from a team. Yeah, that's great. I want to uh, a couple more questions. I want to be mindful of your time. Um, in 2018, um, you started uh, a charity arm of. Uh, Spartan Medical called uh, the Prophet Brothers Foundation. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, the foundation and and, and uh, its mission and purpose? Yeah, um, mm -hmm. almost five years ago, my my brother was a, a major part of the organization. You know, my my number one teammate. He passed uh, almost five years ago at forty five unexpectedly. 
So, you know, in commemoration of what he and I cared about most, uh, we really wanted to start a, a foundation in, in, in his honor. It was to, you see little things where we, on our logo, we put his, his initials in mind. And, sure. and it's kind of a, keep, keeping the same uh, processes we tried to create together to make a difference in the world. So, so really it came down to the same type of thing I'd mentioned in business. We, we want a charity to do nearly the same thing because we're very good at what we do where we focus on the front lines with organizations and people that are making a real difference hand-to-hand, person-to-person, and every charity does great work. Yeah. But for us, it's it's people that have the propensity to do good and they lack the resources, but my God, they give it all and they're affecting people with with local on the front lines type of support. That's what we, we were always looking for. And those are the things where, you know, we're very good at vetting. We're very good at business. We're very good at the back end of everything. We are one of the most fascinating small businesses that can operate like a medium or large size business, even our software systems, we use, you know, the latest, greatest ERP systems that sponsor the Super Bowl and whatnot. You know? yeah. So, yeah. so we, we, we can do just about anything, but with charitable work, it's, it's, it's a huge passion in the sense that the impact you can make by paying attention to the people that need the help and you know exactly what they're going to do with it. If, if you can get an organization in Annapolis, a sailboat, they're not using it for any other purpose other than taking wounded warriors and yeah. veterans out on the water, teaching them how to sail. And what does that do? Why are they out there? When you're focusing on a sailboat, you're not thinking about anything else. Yeah. And that's what they do for a living. So we, we find these organizations. And the Annapolis Waterfront has been great. And it's the same thing. It's get people out on the water. And, and it doesn't matter whether it's a paddleboard or a sailboat or anything. It's, Just, it's, it's get them out there and that sense of community with other veterans and a focus and learning a new life skill and being out, being out on the water. Yeah. Those are things where they're not bringing in billions of dollars, right? They don't have, they're a small charity making a huge impact. Yeah. So my goal is to, to prove this model kind of in the local area, but, but the, the concept here is the Maryland area is our anchor, but our, my, my goal is to create a sea of support genuinely because we're focused on a lot of these water thing, water sports because we're close to it in Annapolis right now. But there's so much more. There's, but, but we could. this is something that's reproducible in any part of the country. Yeah. So that was really our passion is, is getting, just like I said, in business or military, front lines. I bet it shouldn't be a... Yeah, uh, no offense to generals. There's a lot of all of them are great. <laughs> yeah, that's. <laughs> but I'm better on the front lines. I love that. Um, at Spartan Medical, is there any, any new and exciting? We talked about the um, the health pack. We talked about what you're doing in the the space of mental health. Um, is there anything you guys are working on now or looking towards the future that maybe you can give us a sneak peek into things that you're even looking at or exploring in terms of uh, needs unmet? Yeah, I think I think our focus in our core business is. Like I said, sterile prepackaged. We think a lot of the business and most economic analysts and whatnot, the, the inventory surgery center is going to be bigger and bigger um, as it's, you can be much more efficient, quick for some of the procedures, whether they're extremities, um, you know, herniations. A lot, there's a lot of things that you can do where the hospitals may be doing the bigger, longer procedures where there's there's more risk, right? So for us, if in the, the ASCs are very small. I mean, they're very small buildings, focused staff. They want to move quickly, efficiently, and to do that, they need those types of tools in their toolbox. So yeah. I'd say that's what we've been in our core business focus on. We've talked about the the major national solutions we're trying to bring on sure. with with hidden pandemics or national crises of epic proportions. But but when it comes to our core business, we really believe that that we want to get ahead of the market and, and market may go kicking and screaming, but in some places it's just I need it now and I can't wait six hours because we need to operate on this patient. You know, think about it. You go get an operation, you gotta take a day off. You get there and you're like, hey, there was a sorry, bud, there was a hole in our retractor system. Ugh. Come back uh, when we have an opening four months from now. You probably need to be there for your surgery. Yeah. For me, I put a surgery off for like eight months until my chief medical officer of the company was like, dude, you need to go get that done. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so to, as a business owner, I was like, it could wait. Right? It, was, it wasn't a big yeah. deal. It's just the efficiency and getting it done, the the old ways of doing things. And again, what happens if they get a surgical site infection? The health insurance company isn't going to pay for it. 
So a lot of these things, when you're, when you're faster, quicker, nimbler, you need companies like us that are faster, quicker, nimbler and can find the products and the services that can, that can meet your needs. So that's kind of our, our focus over the last, you know, I'd say year or two. Um, and we'll continue because that's, that's going to be the big one. Great. So as you think about the work you and your team do to improve uh, and save lives in the face of so many challenges, we've got mental health, PTSD, chronic conditions, and the list goes on. What keeps you up at night? What's, 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 what's around the bend that you're like, we got to get ahead of this? Yeah, for, for me, honestly, I, I feel like we, we are very good at predicting problems. And like I said, we've got an amazing staff and, and everyone in the company is the smartest people I've ever met. Mm-hmm. So we're very good at that. What, what keeps me awake at night is, again, the lack of objections, the lack of barriers, the lack of a real reason why not. And we can call that apathy, like I mentioned earlier. It's like that that apathetic people want to be a part of, of something where they're making a difference. Everyone wants to go to work and and make a difference. And that 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 apathy can sometimes be, well, not that it's not my problem, but I don't know how to fix it. It's like, no, 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 listen, we're we're giving you that reason, the, the actual solution. Just tell us what's wrong with it. Right. But if you can't get there. And we're dealing with major, major problems. Like if you're a hospital and you're losing money, it would be maybe you look at your revision surgeries because no one's paying for them. You have to pay for them. You're not being reimbursed. But that may take quarters to figure out why we're losing money, right? Yeah. It's not a mystery. It's just by the time those quarters come up, they're dealing with something else. So the, that consistency of just solve the problem. And as a, as a cadet, and I've used it all through my professional career, Patton's quote of, do your full duty. The rest will take care of itself. Yeah. So you need the numbers. You need the data. You need the history. You need the solutions. But look, if we're all doing our best and we're all mission-oriented, we all want the same thing. Everyone wants to make a difference. Yeah. And so what, what keeps me awake is I know that about humanity, but when it's, when it's not happening and there's not a reason why, that, that's the thing that keeps me awake at night. But I have it. It just drives me to, to do more, right? Let me ask you this real quick and then we can close. What, what I, you know, I've talked to others, worked with others. They talked about resistance. There seems to be a culture of resistance in some, some institutions. Why do you think that is? You know, interestingly enough, I, I would have agreed with that, of, you know, five years ago and, and beyond in the past. That was oftentimes the case, but we maneuvered around that resistance. Yeah. And, and it's almost like people are trained because there's so many people. Think about all the spam calls you get and everything. Everyone's trying to sell you something. Yeah. So, it, you know, finding the people you can trust and whatnot is difficult. But, but the resistance is we're fine with what we're doing. Well, and yet the problem persists, yeah. right? So the resistance is oftentimes based on those initial barriers. Where it's like, no, we have everything we need. We're good to go. The COVID crisis and more of these crises that we're talking about are changing that that resistance, I think. So now the question is, like you said, apathy or shrug your shoulders. I didn't know. So I hate to call it ignorance, but it's more or less the head in the sand because I'm not a PhD in X, X Y, and Z in mental health. Well, neither am I, but I, I put the pieces together and I pay attention and I try to get the best value for the customer. I listen to the needs. So that those are things where, where if people just engage and don't say, well, the problem, whatever it is, it's not working. So how about you just keep asking questions? Start with a Google machine. Give someone a call. Yeah. Make the, all the consultants work for free until they can sell you something, right? Yeah. It's like, so keep asking questions. And, and, and oftentimes it's, when it's too late, people struggle. Oh, I didn't know who to call, what to do. We don't have funding for it. So, but you didn't mention any of those barriers if you engaged. Yeah. There's all types of ways it can be done if you're just honest and open and just say, look, we, we're, we're not budgeted for this this year, but we can do X. Fine. Yeah. There's all types of ways. But get those out there. Yeah. What is what is stopping you from progressing forward? And talk to people that you can talk to about it. Yeah. So that apathy, if, if people just really, you know, I hate to think that people would say, well, I don't get paid more to, to do this or work harder. You know, I don't know if COVID did that. You know, I don't know. Yeah. I don't see it in my world because, of, you know, but I'm saying in a lot of places, what do you get? And maybe that's industry, healthcare. It's like maybe you, we do start bonusing excellence. 
you know, not just the healthcare system or whatever that gets an award for doing great. That's terrific. That's the hospital I want to go to as a patient. Yeah. But maybe we do start getting that that buy-in from the employees and whatnot and, and make them all – everyone wants to be a part of the win. We, You know, Lance Armstrong and, and Buzz Aldrin, they were the ones that, you know, initially got Band of the Moon credit. But 50, 60,000 people were involved intimately and in all the – Years and years of making this happen, and when it, when the end of the day happens, guess what? That was that was something Americans felt pride in. Right. It wasn't just NASA. It wasn't just the Department. It wasn't just the space program. It wasn't just Neil and Buzz. America took took that victory, yeah. and that's what we need. And it's not that we need another space program, right? I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that we all need to be a part of of. Of forward movement and momentum. I think everyone wants that, but they're not seeing it. Yeah. And that's a failure in leadership mm-hmm. in any organization. What are we doing today and how are we making a difference? Leave every day saying, I made the world a better place. And and we're all very good. Celebrate excellence and do something that you say, I did something great today. If everyone did that, we'd be set in a moon program, whatever that next one is, and we can get there again. We got to stop the bickering, the fighting, the resistance, if you will. Yeah. The the look over here. Don't worry about X, Y, and Z. Focus on the mission, and let's get it let's get it done together. Yeah, I love it. Well, that's hard to follow up. I'll I'll leave you with one last question. Um, is there anything that you'd like to share with our listeners and viewers that uh, maybe I didn't ask you or I missed today? No, you know, you were the best interviewer ever. So <laughs> you, I'm going to leave you with that. Yeah, okay. that. And uh, no, this this was great because I uh, great. I was able to really talk about the things that I care about. And if anything, it's it's let's uh, we jokingly created the tenth principle of war, which is the nine principles are big in the military. But what we found in going through the nine principles of war, which are very commonly taught in every military academy of the world, is are we asking the right question? And, and I go through, it was a funny way we found it because no one actually knows how Napoleon learned. It was a retrospective study that Clausewitz did on war, the, the book, but no one actually asked the question of, well, it was retrospective. Where did Napoleon learn yeah. what he did from? So it was one of those things where we said, well, let's create the 10th principle, which is, are you asking the right question? A retrospective study doesn't tell us how Napoleon learned his tactics, right? Maybe it who knows? It's a great question. Someone may hypothesize, but but it's not taught necessarily as this is exactly what happened, right? Yeah. But we, for hundreds of years, it's like this is this is what Napoleon did, and it's good, and that's how we do modern warfare with yeah. maneuver and economy of force and <laughs> all these things. So asking the right question, and then the next one to the right people, keep asking. Yeah. Let's 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 have a solution oriented mindset. Yeah, that sounds good. I love it. Well, Vince Prophet, we want to thank you for your for your years of service to our country, all the work that you and your team does every day to uh, give people hope for better days. And uh, it's been an honor and privilege to speak with you today. And uh, good luck for the rest of the year and with all the programs and products and services that you guys deliver to to uh, help improve lives, save lives. Thank you so much. Sounds good. Thank Thanks you so much. A, B, C. A, always, B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. We're the Pinkston team, and this has been Coffee with Closers. Be sure to subscribe for more episodes and follow us on Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn. Catch us next time. We know you're not busy.